Next talk is Li Hong Li, who's going to talk to us about stochastic variance reduction methods for policy estimation. All right, thank you. Um, so I would like to thank the organizers to, um, invite, to invite me to come to Simon Institute to uh, talk about some uh, recent work that we did last summer. Um, so this is a, uh, a, some work um, that Simon Du from CMU uh, did for uh, his summer intern uh, last summer. And um, I have a background work in reinforcement learning. Um, this is about a, this is a talk about reinforcement learning, uh, but this is not a, trade, a typical um, thing that uh, you that seems you find uh, common in reinforcement learning work because it has used some of the um, some of the recent advances in optimization to solve reinforcement learning problems. And I'm still learning this kind of topic, and I think that some of the ideas can be very powerful. And I, I, I hope that uh, uh, you'll find it interesting too. Um, so reinforcement learning, um, so just very briefly, um, so it's about um, finding a policy to maximize long-term reward. In particular, we have a agent uh, or robot here um, taking actions to affect the world, and in return, uh, we receive reward, one step, immediate reward, from the world and the next states. And, this, and then this interaction repeats, um, and over time, we want to uh, we want to look at this quantity called the expected long-term return from a certain state. Uh, we call it value of a state. Uh, this is a discounted total, uh, discounted cumulative reward for the future by following that policy to choose actions. And then the goal of RL, roughly speaking, is to optimize the policy so that this uh, V function is maximized. Uh, so this step is sometimes called policy optimization. Um, in this talk, however, I'm going to talk about a special, or a more special case of reinforcement learning, a specialized case where, where uh, we are given a fixed policy, and then we just want to uh, estimate or evaluate that policy without op optimizing it. So although it seems simpler, it turns out to be a crucial step in some of the policy uh, improvement algorithms like policy iteration or, or actor critique, and it can be interesting of it on its own. Uh, for example, um, since some people have talked about machine teaching uh, today, um, you can think of um, the states as to measure the, the state of a, uh, some learning state of a student. And then this long estimating the value function is the same as estimating or predicting the long term, how uh, long term success of this teaching strategy, pi, on a particular student in a current state. Right? Um, and because of that, um, for convenience, uh, we let's drop the dependence on pi and a for the rest of the talk because now they're fixed. Um, so all, again, all we need to do is to estimate the value of the state. Um, and in here, in this talk, uh, we focus on linear function approximation, uh, which I'll, I'll uh, describe more precisely later. Um, and then we look at the batch setting where uh, we assume that data are given beforehand. Uh, so this is not a in online learning setting where we see a stream of data coming in. Uh, we only, we're only given a set, a fixed set of data, and we try to uh, compute or estimate the value function based on this data set. In this setting, um, so here are the main results. Uh, so what we, what we have done here is to propose uh, first order algorithms that or gradient-like algorithms um, that enjoys linear convergence. What it means is that in order for the algorithm to compute a solution that is within optimal epsilon, uh, that's within epsilon um, distance to the true parameter that we care about, we only need nd times log one of epsilon many uh, steps or, or computational complexity to, to do it. And n is number of data and d is the uh, uh, the number of features or dimension of the data. So this is in contrast to previous work where uh, you either use a batch algorithm uh, to compute exact uh, solution that normally scales uh, quadratically with the dimension, or if you use a um, gradient descent-like algorithm to solve it, and then the convergence is slower in terms of one over epsilon dependence. 
Um, so if you look at this, um, so we either gain a factor of d compared to this one, or uh, we have an exponential speed up if you look at the uh, dependence on one of epsilon. Um, and in this work, the key technical ingredients are of these. The first thing I think is perhaps the most interesting to me is that um, for policy evaluation in reinforcement learning, as you see soon, um, it's usually described as a fixed point solution of, some, of a Bellman equation. Um, but here, um, we, took, we took a different approach by reformulating this solution or this uh, equation as a set of point optimization problem. It seems to make the problem more complicated, but it turns out that once we do this, then something nice happens and we're able to apply some of the advanced optimization techniques, such as stochastic variance, redu uh, variance reduction techniques uh, to, um, to speed up the optimization. Um, and then um, most of the analysis goes to analyzing eigenvalues of the uh, corresponding matrix and the update rules. But these, the third step is uh, most technical. I think the, the first one would be uh, it's uh, very interesting to, to describe this. And all the results, um, including the algorithms and the analysis, can be extended directly to uh, more uh, complicated situations where you have eligibility traces or, or policy learning, uh, which I'll explain a little bit more uh, during the talk. Um, so if you need to remember one slide, this is the, the main result. Um, and for the talk, I'm going to have uh, describe some of the details. Um, so let's start with problem, the problem setup, just to give you an idea of the notation and what kind of objective function we try to optimize. Um, so here, um, in this case, we, uh, we model the problem as a Markov reward process. Uh, this is different from typical reinforcement learning where we uh, often look at Markov decision process. Here we look at policy evaluation, right? So there's no action. So we remove the action and MDP becomes MRP, just the reward. Um, you can think of it as just a Markov chain added uh, with a reward function, uh, with, with reward observation. And as before, the value function is just the, uh, the total sum of discounted rewards for the future, okay? If you start from that state. Okay. Um, you can, and one foundation re uh, result in, in reinforcement learning is the Bellman equation, which, is a re which uh, gives a recursive uh, 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 relation of state variance used here. Um, so what it says is that if you look at the long-term reward, if you look at the long-term uh, reward of a certain state, um, it's the same as the one-step reward plus the futures, all the future, uh, the long-term reward of the next state. Okay? And this is uh, just a, a matrix form to, to write the Bellman equation. Um, v is a vector um, of um, each dimensional corresponding to one state, and same for R, and P is a transition matrix here. So just a, uh, a succinct way to, to write the Bellman equation. And as you can see, the, when you have a lot of states, the dimension of V is huge, so there's no way to scale up. Uh, one way to avoid this problem is that you, we can use approximation. Some people use uh, neural networks. Uh, some people use simpler things like a linear approximation, which is what we focus here. Um, in linear function approximation, we approximate a value function by a linear combination of features, uh, where V here is the d-dimensional feature, and theta is the parameter, d-dimensional parameter we try to fit from data. If you write it in the in matrix form, like the one here, you can write it he, this way. V hat is a vector of, uh, of whose dimension is number of states, and phi is the, the feature matrix, state by feature matrix, and theta is the, a vector of d dimension. Okay. Um, so, so this is, I think this is all the notation, uh, most of the notation, and then um, for in policy evaluation, what we want to do is as follows. We're given a s set of data that is a trajectory of n steps. So we have the first day, first reward, and the next day, next reward, et cetera, until n steps later. Um, unlike s many supervised learning problems, for example, regression, there's no target label here, right? Because we, don't, uh, we only observe intermediate 
one step rewards, but what we try to estimate is long-term reward. So usually what people do in reinforcement learning is to use other kinds of objective. Uh, the most popular one is probably uh, means this guy uh, called mean square projected Bellman equation. Um, it's motivated by, uh, it's inspired by the, uh, the Bellman equation. So in Bellman equation, if you remember here, um, V is called a fixed point solution to the Bellman equation because if you apply the, this, op you can think of the right hand side as an operator, right? Given any function V, you apply this linear operator, you get a new function. And in this case, the V function happens to be the fixed point of this equation. Okay. Um, inspired by this, you can think of something like this. You have, a, let's say you have a linear function approximation, uh, a linearly approximated value function. You apply some, uh, a Bellman operator, and this guy in general does not lie in the linear space of the feature that you have, right? So you, you do a projection step to project it back to the linear space of your d-dimensional feature, and you want this projected value function to be the same as the, the one you started with. So this is, in a sense, this is a, a different kind of fixed point solution that you try to um, solve for. Uh, and so this is the, just the, the um, inspiration. If you write, try to write down the, uh, the mathematical, the mathematics, it's the function is this. Um, you want to minimize this guy, and this guy we put in all the, the notation that we show on the previous slide. Um, it's a little bit technical, but it's uh, straightforward to write it down. Um, at the end of the day, you end up with something like this. You have a quadratic term here, plus a possibly a regularization term of the parameter. And this guy, the, um, the matrix A and, and the vector B and matrix C are computed here. Um, a is a average of individual, the A is comp computed on individual examples or individual steps. In each A sub T, it's a rank one matrix. Okay. Um, and for B is a vector, it's also average over all the steps. Similar for C, it's a rank one matrix, it's similar to A, but dif defined differently. Um, so the, the details of the A, how A, B, and C are defined here is are not important. What is important is that now we end up with a objective function like this. And A and C are D dimensional, a D by D matrix, and B is a, a D dimensional matrix. And this is the, uh, the objective function that we are going to work on here. So um, any question about at this point? So how do you read up uh, V hat from this? Uh, V hat? So you want to solve that equation, right? Right, yeah. Read up from this, you say that it is precisely this data star. Oh, right. What did this precise mean? Yeah, so when you write, a, when you replace V, uh, V hat by this guy, feature times uh, uh, parameter, you put it here and you put in all these uh, distribution of sample and you put in the transition probability. Well, essentially what could empirical projected mean square error, replace this by the empirical probabilities and you eventually end up with this. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Is there any insight on how the, like what you lose in the projection? Like, can you control that error? The pro are you talking about the definition of projection? Um, it's just the, the standard L2 projection. No, I mean, how much do you lose? Like, is, is it oh. that you're so far off? It depends on what you mean by lose. If you, um, it could be the case that um, after this Bellman operator, this is a linear span, okay? After the one step operator, the, the value function can be way uh, this far away from the, the space. And after projection, it can change a lot. So, um, Linear approximation is not so good. Um, if you don't have good features, which is uh, expected. Maybe I missed it, but you're picking a particular form of regularization here, right? That's what the real term is? Uh, this guy, right? Yeah. Um, so this is optional. Um, by different kind, I think you could use, um, people have used L1. I think that's possible, yeah. I think it, uh, yeah, I think we can change the L1, it doesn't matter. As long as it's convex, it's fine. And even if it's rho is zero, which means that there's no regularization, uh, our, all, everything still works here, which is something interesting that I'll go back to at the end of the talk. Okay. 
So this is the, um, the setup, the objective. Um, with this objective, now I move on to the, uh, the formulation of a set of, as the formulation of this objective as a settle point problem. Why do I need to do that? Uh, it's because of a challenge working with mean square projected bound error. Um, so this is just the, um, the same objective that I copy from the previous slide. Um, and A's and B's and C's are decomposed like this way. Of, um, different from many supervised learning problems like uh, SVM or, or logistic regression or others, um, this objective function doesn't have the sum over data structure, okay? In, re in classification problems, you have a surrogate loss of the, uh, the classification error, and you sum over this individual loss over all the data points that you have in your training data. And then when you try to optimize this surrogate loss, you can sample the, uh, the data points from the training set stochastically and do stochastic gradient descent, right? So this is, and, and then you can do all sorts of things to speed that up. Um, so this, this is very powerful, but here, because of the, of the structure of A, B, and C here, it's not straightforward how you can decompose that computation in, onto um, individual examples. So this is the, um, the challenge here. Um, if you try to optimize this objective function directly, you can, oops, you can end up with a square de uh, quadratic dependence on a number of features. Um, and recently, about well, seven years ago, <laughs> um, and Sutton and, and, and his colleagues, including Char Basin over there, has a, a nice algorithm called GTD2 um, that has a, a linear dependence of the number of features. But then, um, uh, but then the convergence rate is slow. So now the question is whether we can still get an algorithm that has a linear convergence, well, linear complexity, but with much faster convergence speed. And it turns out that it starts with the reformulation of the objective as a settle point problem. Um, so to, to do this, um, let me remind you of the conjugate function. Um, given any function f of w, you can define a conjugate function of f star u this way. So this is the general <coughs> uh, the definition of the conjugate function. If your f is this quadratic function here, weighted, quad, well, weighted, quad, uh, weighted uh, uh, norm square function here, then this dual function is of similar form, except that now the, the weights, fun, the, weight, uh, this, the matrix C here becomes C inverse. Um, so now we look at the, uh, the mean square projected bound error that we care about here. Um, it, it has the sum of two parts. This part is like this, right? So what we can do is to replace this part on the right-hand side with something that uh, looks more complicated, and then we end up with this, okay? Now, this yellow part becomes this uh, bigger e expression. So, as a, instead of having a minimization problem as before, now we have a minimax problem. This function, let's call, this objective function, let's call it L. It takes us two inputs, theta and W. Theta is the primal parameter that we care about, and W is a dual parameter. Okay, um, so the interesting thing about this is that L is convex concave, it's convex in theta and concave in W. So minim, minimax here is fine, okay? We're minimizing the convex part and opt, maximizing the con, concave part. So it, it looks nice. More importantly, this allows you to decompose, oops, decompose um, the objective function into sum of data form. So this is the L, and you can decompose L into this because all the quantities that we need to compute from data, matrix A, vector B, and uh, matrix C, they, they are average over the A sub T and B sub T and C sub T on individual data points, right? If you remember, um, if you write it down here, um, so, you, so this is, you can, this, this part and this part as well can be decomposed as a sum over all the data, uh, individual losses of data points. So, and now, so now for each one, you can, uh, each one can be easily computed from individual data points. Um, once you realize this uh, connection, then you can, uh, it's straightforward to use existing optimization to, to uh, solve this set of point problem. For example, you can use primal dual batch gradient descent. 
Um, <coughs> Um, it's very straightforward, as you can realize. Um, we initialize the, the parameters, both dual, primal and dual, and we iterate, it iteratively updates the, uh, the parameter using gradient, the gradients. And sigma theta and sigma w are the two step sizes for theta and w. And the gradient b is, is just the gradient of, uh, the partial gradient of derivative of, with respect to theta and with respect to w. And uh, you, you notice that there's a negative sign here. It's because um, here we want to max minimize over theta, but maximize over w. So that's, that's why there's a negative sign here. So that uh, we can use minus here. But other than that, this is a very straightforward uh, uh, algorithm based on the gradient, gradient descent. And uh, the, the iteration cost, you look at this, um, it's linear in the size of data points and the size of uh, the, f the feature dimension, so it's nice. And later on, I will show very briefly that this algorithm enjoys linear convergence, meaning that uh, if you want to uh, ensure that the solution is within epsilon mistake uh, or epsilon uh, distance to the true parameter, you only need log one of epsilon iteration or steps to, to get there. Um, but still, um, it's not very practical because it has a linear dependence on, on n. I mean that every iteration you have to go over the whole data set once. Can we do better? Um, yes, and you can think of stochastic version of it. Uh, the only difference is that instead of computing the full gradient, now you randomly sample a, a data point, t, from one of these n data points, and compute a stochastic gradient. Okay. Um, and then, so L sub t is a loss in, for step t, and then the a, t, b, t, and c, t are the, are the quantity for that step. Um, so now we get rid of the dependence on n because it only depends on d now. However, convergence is sublinear, it's slow. Uh, because here, um, there is extra variance or noise in the gradient. The gradient is not the true gradient of the objective function. You sample from it, um, so it has noise that slows down the convergence. Um, and by the way, this turns out to recover uh, the GTT2 algorithm, uh, which has been observed uh, two years ago by two uh, papers. Um, so, um, okay. Now here comes the variance reduction part. Uh, okay. Um, in if you're, let's look at here. The um, the problem that leads to the slow convergence here is this guy that has high variance compared to full gradient descent. Now what we can do is to reduce the variance of this guy. How do we do it? Um, there is a, a technique called SVRG, Stochastic Variance Reduced Gradient, that does exactly that. What it does is to change the, uh, replace the uh, stochastic gradient by this guy. Um, this guy has the, the extra terms in green um, you can think of that as some kind of control variant to reduce variance. Um, um, for, if for some data point, some subscript t, um, it's far away from the, uh, the true gradient, then this tends to cancel that extra variance. Okay? Um, so that's, that's how we reduce variance of the whole thing. Or if you look at it another way, um, when you run the algorithm for a long time, um, this theta bar w and uh, uh, theta tilde and w tilde, they're close to your current uh, estimate. And then these two terms are almost the same, so they almost cancel each other, and you end up with something like this, which is like a full gradient algorithm. And, but of course, you need to uh, maintain this, uh, these extra copies of uh, uh, parameters periodically. Uh, but hopefully, um, the, the hope is that uh, this update, which requires a pass of the, over the full data set, uh, this update does not happen too often. Okay. And in fact, you, you can show that uh, it only uh, happen very, uh, can happen only rarely. Um, and, and, and the convergence rate here, as it turns out, is linear because, uh, because the variance reduction here. And then um, there's another technique called Saga that also uh, reduces variance like SVRG. Um, its idea is similar, but the, the, the details are quite different. Um, one th difference is that it doesn't need the periodic update of this batch gradient, this guy here, 
Okay? So you have one fuel parameter to tune, then uh, SVRG, which is nice. However, um, it requires to maintain a gradient <coughs> for each indi individual data points, uh, which require extra space. So this is, uh, uh, it makes it more challenging to scale up. Uh, but still, um, if you can afford to do this, um, it gives you a similar speed up as SVRG. Um, and then, um, and then we can extend this to a policy policy evaluation, where you have a target policy to estimate, but your data points are, are generated by a different policy. So this is what we call a policy learning. It could be useful when you collect one copy of data and use that data to estimate multiple policies. You don't have to uh, collect several copies of data. Um, this can be. Um, Extended our solution can be extended to our policy case. Um, the only difference is how we define A, B, C. They're defined similarly but using a different distribution. So, so the algorithm and the analysis that we're going to show are applicable directly to this case. And similarly for uh, for policy evaluation, when you have eligibility traces, eligibility traces is a trick in reinforcement learning to um, to sort of do uh, balances, uh, variance, and, and and bias in uh, policy evaluation, um, it, you can think of it as something to, to control the, uh, the gap between these two objective functions, which is the, the projected Bauman equation and the mean square error of value function approximation. Um, uh, today I'm, got, I'm not going to the details of these two, but, um, uh, but um, they're very similar to, uh, to the standard policy evaluation case. Okay. Um, so these are the algorithms for variance reduction, and now what, what are the complexity bounds that we can get from that? Uh, here's a table that summarizes the, the results. For the first one, LSTD is, is, it stands for least squares temporal difference. Um, it computes, the, uh, it computes the, the, the true parameter by using an uh, exact calculation, a ma exact matrix inversion. To, to do the calculation. And this takes um, nd square complexity to do it. Exact, but it has a quadratic dependence. And the second one, GTD2, it has linear dependence on the number of features. Uh, but um, unfortunately, the, uh, the dependence on epsilon is, uh, is sublinear. So these are not uh, the, uh, the limitations. And then we put in in previous slides, we talked about the batch gradient and the variance reduced gradients updates. For these two, um, we have the, um, uh, the linear convergence rate in this form, uh, meaning that the error decays exponentially fast. Um, more interestingly, for SVRG and Saga, we have, um, we have this guy. What is this guy? Um, okay, I should mention that in all, this, all three bounds here, the kappa one, kappa two, and kappa three, these are um, algorithm specific and constants, okay? And, and if you look at the analysis, they, they are about condition number that are used by this algorithm. So these three constants are not comparable, okay? But what's interesting thing here is that if you look at Saga and SVRG, if you have more and more data, no matter how big this constant is, you can, you can reduce this uh, condition number. <coughs> By, by one over n. Okay? So you have more and more data, um, then this SVRG and Saga tends to be faster than uh, the batch gradient one. Um, analyze, analyzing the, giving this bounds is, is not trivial. Uh, so here I'm going to use two slides, only two slides, to give you a sense of, of uh, the, uh, the kind of analysis we, we, we do here. Um, is for this guy, which is much simpler than this from this analysis. Um, so it's for, you remember, this is the, um, the batch version, batch gradient of the settle point problem, okay? Uh, these two numbers are the step size, and we define beta as the ratio of the two step sizes. Okay. And then if you look at the uh, this update rule and, and let's, theta star and w star be the optimal solution for the settle point problem. And you look at the, if you apply the first order optimality condition for this guy, um, and then combine this with the update rule, after some uh, manipulation, you get a, um, an, an, an equation of this form, where 
delta m, roughly is speaking, is the error in the parameter, how, how far away it is from the true parameter. And, uh, and then the, after one more iteration, the error is changed to this guy, and the change is governed by this matrix, i minus sigma, the step size of theta, times this matrix g. Uh, so it, as you can imagine, how fast this guy, the error vector, decays to zero, depends on the eigenvalue of this matrix, right? Um, and then uh, we, have, we have found a, a previous result that says if your beta is uh, large enough, then this matrix is diagonalizable. Um, so let's call the, uh, the eigen decomposition to be Q, lambda Q inverse, lambda is diagonal matrix, and Q is a, uh, a, a non-singular matrix, the eigenvectors. Um, now to continue, we replace, uh, replace G here by this eigen decomposition. Uh, we get this, and we move the, the Q inverse out and multiply both sides by Q inverse on to the left, and we get something like this. Um, so you can realize that there's similarity here. It, if you look at this term, it, this equation gives you how this guy evolves after one more iteration, okay? So this is exactly what we do. We capture how fast convergence happens by this potential function. The potential function is just two norm of this guy, okay? And, uh, and because of this, we have this, uh, this uh, inequality that tells you to quantify how fast this potential function may decay to zero. And if you can select the, uh, the step size properly, you can ensure that uh, this happens exponential, well, uh, this potential function decays to zero exponentially fast. And because the, um, the parameter that we care about, we try to learn, is upper bounded by the norm of this uh, <coughs> delta vector. So if, and this delta vector is in turn uh, upper bounded by the two norm of the Q squared times the potential function. It, since the potential function decays to zero exponentially fast, um, we have that the, uh, the parameter that we uh, we try to optimize also uh, uh, decays to uh, theta star exponentially fast. Okay. Um, and then, of course, the, most of the uh, analysis goes to analyzing the eigen, the eigen uh, decomposition, eigenvalues of the, the matrix G. Uh, in other words, we try to analyze the Q and, and lambda, and, uh, but these are all technical things, and. Uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, put a paper on archive soon, and so if you're interested, feel free to, to take a look. Um, but I hope these two slides give you an idea of how we approach the get the, the convergence rate. Um, finally, I'm going to uh, give you some very preliminary uh, experiment results on two very simple problems. Um, the com competing algorithms are this. One is TD, uh, the standard, uh, uh, the standard uh, policy evaluation, the first policy evaluation algorithm in linear, uh, uh, with linear functions, and it, it has the sublinear convergence rate, and, but uh, the update is cheap. Um, we also have the more recent GTD, uh, it does, has similar uh, performance guarantees. Um, and then these two are the two one that we, we propose here based on the saddle point formulation. And LSTD is not actually a competing algorithm, it's an uh, exact solution. So it serves as a reference point. Uh, and remember that this is expensive to compute. Um, and the two problems, very simple, are this. One is random MVPs, the other is mounting car. And these random MVPs are generated randomly by randomly deciding the transition probability and reward, et cetera. And mountain car here um, is the problem, as you may know already, is to try to drive the car from some starting point to, to here, to the start here. Um, and this problem has two dimensions and three actions. You need to, you either go forward, backward, or remain neutral for the car. Okay. Um, and the sample sizes are 100K and 5K for the mountain car, and the features are 200 and 300 respectively. Um, so for random MDPs, so here's the plot. Uh, we have a number of algorithms, but roughly speaking, uh, for GTD, these, the first two, you, uh, let's look at the IDGTT2, which is here. It's pretty slow because um, 
uh, the condition number of this problem is very bad, it's large. So uh, we think that if we add a little bit more of L2 regularization, it will speed up a lot. Um, TD, uh, this guy, it's also slow, and you, you think that it's, it doesn't, you don't see a linear depend, uh, convergence, uh, because here the objective function is in the log. This is the, uh, the objective function with, uh, in log scale. So, um, and in contrast, the, the green one, SVRG and this guy, Saga, the two algorithms that we propose, they, they enjoy a roughly a linear convergence to, the, to zero, the objective function. Um, similarly for mounting car, where you have uh, GTD, now it's slightly faster um, uh, here, and then uh, TD is this guy, and this is the batch one. Now it, um, you may not be able to see, but after a long time, the batch one now finally seems to be have a linear different convergence as we predict in the theory. And this, this guy, um, SVRG and, and, and Saga, now after very quickly, after a few more iterations, uh, the objective function decays um, linearly here. Um, so to, to wrap up, um, this is motivated by a, a few related work in the past. Um, most importantly are the variance reduced methods uh, from convex optimization, including SVRG and, and, and Saga, uh, by a few authors. And more recently, there is a uh, Bach, uh, Francis Bach's group has a uh, some work that applies variance reduction techniques to solve saddle point problem. Uh, but the approach is, uh, is not directly applicable here because they require a proximal mapping in the algorithm that are not efficiently computed in, in policy evaluation problem here. In here, we and all our operations are have linear dependence, uh, linear complexity in dimension, in feature dimension. And furthermore, um, um, the algorithm requires that uh, the objective function is strongly convex and strongly concave in the primal and in the dual. And here we only require strongly concavity in the dual, uh, but for the primal we don't have to. You remember that that means that the row, the parameter row, can be zero in our objective function, which is often the case in, in practice when you, uh, at least in the original L, uh, TD learning. Um, and then, um, and then, early on, there is the um, for in policy evaluation, there is the gradient-based TDs um, like GTD2 and uh, GTD and GTD2 that we discussed in, in this talk. Um, these algorithms are derived from various different principles. Um, they heavily rely on the, uh, the, the objective function, and here we take a different approach. Uh, we reformulate it as a saddle point problem, and then we, we can apply uh, many uh, t techniques from the literature, optimization literature, to uh, tackle this problem from a more systematic and, and, and principled approach. And I uh, hope that this will, I think this is very powerful and interesting because now it bridges the gap between optimization and, and, and some problems in reinforcement learning. And we have shown that in this talk that you can apply variance reduction like SVG Saga to speed up reinforcement learning. Now, can you, now the question is how can we, uh, perhaps there are other interesting connection that um, you can, uh, can borrow from optimization to solve reinforcement learning problems better. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. There's also the incremental TD, LSTD. Um, uh, it, it's linear time, but then uh, it's, it's an open question to analyze its convergence rate, it's unclear. Um, but uh, empirically from the paper, um, it seems that the convergence is not linear, but uh, it remains, it's an open question. Okay, so to conclude, um, in this talk we talk about a, a set of point reformulation of policy evaluation, and this allows us to build a connection between reinforcement learning and, and optimization, and then use techniques from optimization to solve reinforcement learning better. Um, and for future, I think there are a few interesting things to look at. One is to extend the, our linear case, linear function approximation case, to nonlinear case, of course, like uh, in neural networks, uh, which is quite popular these days. Um, but it's very hard. Um, and the second one is to um, extend it to control case. Um, we have looked at policy evaluation when the policy is fixed. Now can, we, can you apply similar things, similar techniques to to learn the optimal policy directly. So that's the, what, what we mean by the control case here. 
is also quite uh, challenging, uh, but I think it's worth looking at. Um, the third is that in general, let's see, um, let's see that um, there is, there may be a more interesting uh, gap, well, interesting uh, uh, connections between optimization and RL, and and it would be interesting to to apply some of the uh, the stuff in the optimization community to uh, to better solve RL problems. Okay. okay, I think that's the end of the talk, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. So you mentioned that for the uh, diagonalization to hold, beta has to be small enough. Or big enough. Or big enough, sorry. Uh, and uh, so it's going to depend on, I guess, the structure of A and C, how big beta should be? Um, it depends on the condition number of A and B. And uh, yeah, it's the, uh, the expression is a little bit complicated. Okay. Uh, I don't remember so it off the top of my head. So the, the theoretical design holds under the condition that beta satisfies that condition, or does it always hold? Uh, the condition that beta is big enough. Right. Like, do what? you need to derive the final result? Do you need this condition, or? Oh, no, the condition is, uh, all the condition numbers are a condition number of empirical matrices that you, you create. So, so when you, you get the data, you get a matrix, and now you can compute, in principle, you can compute all the condition numbers. Of course, it's, it's challenging, it, it's hard, but then at least in principle, you can compute them, and now you see what, how big is big enough. The computation cost of computing those condition numbers it's, of next It's cost worse than quadratic, yes. <laughs> but the, the point here is that, as, as in most many uh, uh, optimization and practice, you don't, uh, those are the ideal case. And, and then, uh, and, and usually people tune the parameters a little bit. And in fact, um, if, um, I think we have results showing that um, when your learning rate, the step sizes, are not as ideal as we set in the theorem, uh, the performance degrades nice, uh, gracefully, meaning that the, it's still exponential, but perhaps the uh, decay, but the, the exponent may be lower. And so how did you choose the learning rates or the step sizes uh, for the experiments? Um, I think that, um, well, Simon did all of the experiments, and I think he, he, he tried a few possibilities, and, uh, and then it's simple. Yeah. Which is uh, common in matter, well, hyperparameter tuning. <laughs> in some cases, I think you can sm choose a small data set. If you have subsample data, then use that small data set to tune a parameter to find a reasonable range and then you apply the one to your bigger data set. So just to understand, your algorithms are not oblivious to these condition numbers. Obliv oblivious to what? To the condition numbers. So they have to know the condition numbers in order to run. Um, or that, that in is, the analysis. That is the Do you need I to mean, know? In or, if you want to have this guarantee. Do, that the is, do you need to know the numbers or the algorithm can? But, it's the current analysis, but yeah. I think that they are hoping that the algorithm is actually better than that. Right. So, so, so here, the, the analysis assumes that you know this. I think so, yeah. yeah. So then it is not. It's uh, not oblivious, yeah. yeah. But hopefully, the, if, you tune, if it's not too far away from those ideal numbers, then uh, it's fine. And in fact, the, um, the, 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 the most important quantity there is the beta the ratio between the two parameters. Um, so the parameters can be small or big, but uh, I think the, the beta is more important to control to, to control the convergence. Emma. So to pop up a couple levels, it seems like one of the main um, sort of motivations for this work is to be much, much faster computationally in terms of how many iterations are needed in order to converge. And so it seems like that should particularly be helpful in the neural network case. We know and since you are giving such big improvements over TV, which is sort of effectively what Q-learning is um, for those cases, can you speculate on how you might be able to extend this to the nonlinear value function in case? Like, how could these six of ideas be used to a target? Sorry, you know. Uh, sure. Um, that's a good question. I, after this work, uh, I, and my colleagues, and I have been speculating a few times on how to approach the problem, but uh, all the efforts failed so far. 
Um, so perhaps it's not a good time for me to speculate again. <laughs> uh, but I think it's, um, it's quite challenging. Um, it depends on a lot of things. Uh, so for, in, for example, in the non-linear case, even finding the fixed point, it, it's not completely obvious how to define a fixed point solution or, the, uh, or how to minimize the mean square, the mean square projected Bellman error where you have a nonlinear shape. Yeah. Sometimes you, you find this and then you perhaps you locally linearize the space and project it on that, but it's a little bit, it's still not good. I think Rissotin has some paper in the past that depends on the smoothness. I mean, Chaba is on the paper too. Yeah, so it's possible, but it, it's challenging. If you have a large beta and then they are appearing in the cross diagonal, so it might lead to some kind of oscillatory behavior, is that not a problem? Uh, are you talking about a beta? Yeah, the beta is in the cross diagonal, right? Once you oh, yeah, the, the beta is that um, so the, 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 uh, there is the primal part, the theta, and the dual part, w. And the beta controls the ratio of the learning rate, right? right. And, and then the, now the, the problem is that the two, the, the, the theta part, the condition <laughs> number, and the w part's condition number, they can be quite different. So you need beta to somehow to remove that, right. to make it more. I'm guessing it's going to lead to oscillations, like. Because you're going to have the, uh, the non-main diagonal. Oh, oh, I see. Uh, uh, so the, you're talking about um, condition uh, phenomenon when you try to do grain of sand on ill-conditioned Ill problems. Right. right. So you, you may observe things like this. Yeah, it's possible, yeah. When you, we don't have the right beta to, to center a step size, it's possible. So you may have some oscillation, but, but again, it relates to the question that um, it's, it, it affects the, the condition number. So hopefully the, uh, the, uh, the dependence on epsilon is still log one of epsilon, but before that log term, the constant number, which depends on the condition number, is worse. Yeah. 